Well, this is part six of my series on the epistles of Peter. And I have titled this message, A Better Sacrifice. In my previous message, I began considering the significance of the metaphor comparing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to a living stone, a metaphor found not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old. For example, Isaiah used it several times, and both Jesus and other New Testament writers clearly identified this living stone, which the builders rejected, as being none other than the Messiah himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. I finished last time by briefly examining the seven aspects of this metaphor which relate totally to him and no one else, and which were first found in the book of Isaiah. They were, he will be a sanctuary, he will be a stumbling block, he will be a rock of offense, he will be a trap or snare, he will be a foundation stone, a tried and tested stone, and finally, a precious cornerstone. So let's reread these key verses in 1 Peter chapter 2 once more before we continue our examination of their significance. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And as usual, I'm reading first from the Amplified. <clears throat> so, be done with every trace of wickedness, depravity, malignity, and all deceit and insincerity, pretense and hypocrisy, and grudges, envy, jealousy, and slander, and evil speaking of every kind. Like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, and earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk, that by it you may be nurtured and grow into completed salvation. Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, come to him, then to that living stone, which men tried and threw away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come, and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For well, thus it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, honored, precious chief cornerstone. And he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, shall never be disappointed or put to shame. To you then who believe, who adhere to, trust in, and rely on him, is the preciousness. But for those who disbelieve, it is true. The very stone which the builders rejected has become the main cornerstone. And a stone that will cause stumbling. And a rock that will give men offense. They stumble because they disobey and disbelieve God's word. As those who reject him were destined and appointed to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. What a powerful, 
powerful word. Verse 5, which is where we'll begin today, extends the metaphor of Jesus being the living stone, singular and capitalized, therefore a title, right? Which we examined last time and applies it to us as living stones, plural and uncapitalized. All right? See, there's a difference. Here, it is not a title, but a description of what we are to become as we become more like him. We, as living stones, are to be built into a spiritual house or temple where we, as priests of the Most High God, will offer spiritual sacrifices unto him. These are the better sacrifices of my title, right? Spiritual sacrifices. These are the better sacrifices. So let's consider this metaphor in more detail as it forms the backbone of what Peter is saying in this chapter. There are two passages which I feel describe this very well. And note, this metaphor applies to us both individually and, just as importantly, corporately as well. Okay? So individually and corporately. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 9 to 17 in the New King James. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 9 to 17. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. All right? You've got the metaphor. You are God's building. Precious living stones. I have... Yeah. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Verses 16 and 17, very well known, very important. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? I think from this that it is very clear that not only are we a building made from living stones, but that we are God's holy temple built on the foundation of the one truly living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an interesting sub-theme here which might be profitable for future study. I'm not going to touch it today. Just think about this, though. What does it mean, in verse uh, 16, no, verse 17, to defile the temple of God. What 
does it mean to defile the temple of God? Think about that for future study. But for now, this theme of living stones is further developed in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So turn with me please to Ephesians and chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22, and this time I'm going back to the Amplified. Verse 20. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. All right, you're getting the picture. In him... The whole structure is joined, bound, welded together harmoniously. I like that word, harmoniously. That's how we're supposed to be. We're we're bound together. Corporately, we are to be bound or welded together harmoniously. And it continues to rise, grow, increase. Right? It's growing. It's building. It's not static, it's ever building, ever growing, ever getting better. Into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated and sacred to the presence of the Lord. Remember, this applies individually and corporately. In him and in fellowship with one another, You yourselves are also being built up into this structure with the rest to form a fixed abode, a dwelling place of God in, by, and through the Spirit. This is the true church. It's people, not a building. We are the true church. We are the living stones. It's about people. Not bricks and mortar. And we are built in. He builds within us. And then he builds us together corporately. That's what it's about. Harmoniously. That's the true church. It is important to note. That verse 5. Of 1 Peter chapter 2 makes the distinction that unlike the actual temple of Peter's day, or even the tabernacle which came before it, we are not expected to make natural sacrifices, but rather spiritual ones. Yes, Peter tells us that we are part of the priesthood and therefore able to make sacrifices before the Lord. But we are also told that ours are different from what has gone before. Natural or animal sacrifices are no longer needed because Jesus himself has fulfilled that part of the law once and for all. They are no longer unnecessary. Jesus, our high priest, has done all that was and is and ever will be required. The book of Hebrews gives a very detailed explanation of this. So let's just read a small key section for confirmation. You can read the entire chapter for homework. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. Really important, once for all. Once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. As I've mentioned a few times, eternity is a very long time. It's eternal. Once and for all, eternal redemption. Drop down a few lines to verses 22 and 23. Same chapter. 
And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The copies got the natural. But now we have the better. Over the page to Hebrews chapter 10 and one more verse. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, not every day or every week, but one sacrifice for sins, forever, like eternity, that's a long time too, right? He offered one sacrifice forever, done, completed, it is finished, sat down at the right hand of God. Why are these spiritual sacrifices better? The answer is quite simple. The natural sacrifices laid out by the law were dead and bloody, burned by fire, smeared with fat, seasoned with salt. You'll find that in Leviticus chapter 2, about verse 13. And most importantly, temporal. They had to be performed regularly, over and over and over again. They were dead, bloody, burned by fire, smeared with... Doesn't sound very good and pleasant, does it? Doing them over and over and over again. Spiritual sacrifices, however, are living, clean, pure, and holy, and totally acceptable to God. I like that. Living sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices, they're living, clean, pure, holy, and totally acceptable to God. Note what Almighty God himself has to say about natural sacrifices. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 11, Isaiah 1.11 in the New King James says this, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. I think it's pretty clear. In contrast, we read the following in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What then is the nature or the form which these spiritual sacrifices should take? We just read in Romans that first of all, we are to present our bodies, ourselves, all that we are as a living sacrifice which will be acceptable to God. That is part of obedience and abiding which we all preach from this pulpit on a regular basis. Putting down self, our own selfish desires, is definitely a sacrifice in this secular world. But it is essential if we want to present ourselves as acceptable to a holy God. Think about it. 
That's what we're called to do, present ourselves, all that we are, to him. And we're told that will be acceptable. It's an acceptable sacrifice. Another well-known scripture is that we're to bring a sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord, the tabernacle, the temple, the church. Jeremiah, chapter 33. Verses 10 and 11. Jeremiah 33, verses 10 and 11 in the New King James. Thus says the Lord. Again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say, it is desolate without man and without beast. In the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Just an aside, whenever we have this reference to the bride and the bridegroom, yes, it to some extent is the natural but we should realize that that is always as well metaphoric, right? Whenever it mentions it, it's talking about something more than just two people. It's talking about our Lord and Savior. It's talking about the church, right? The bridegroom and the bride. And that metaphor, that image is throughout scripture. And here it is in Jeremiah. So it's referring to all of that, all right? Continuing, the voice of those who will say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. For his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Hallelujah. This is echoed in the New Testament as well. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. This then leads to the sacrifice of thanksgiving, which we find in Psalms as well as in Leviticus. We all have much to be thankful for. Look at a couple of scriptures from Psalms. Psalm 107 and verse 22. Psalm 107 and verse 22 says, Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And a few pages over, Psalm 116 and verse 17. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Then there is the sacrifice of righteousness, something Jeff's been preaching in the last few weeks. If you've missed any, catch up on it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because Jeff's been doing a better job. But there is a sacrifice of righteousness. And it can be a challenge in this secular world where we move and live and have our being. Still in Psalm, Psalm 4 and verse 5. It says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. We should never forget the sacrifice of faith. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 17. 
Philippians 2.17? Yes. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. It is a sacrifice of faith. Our giving is frequently a sacrifice. Still in Philippians. Philippians 4 and verse 18. Philippians 4, 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So there is a sacrifice of giving. These then, and likely others, I don't think my list is exhaustive, are the spiritual sacrifices which God finds acceptable. I hope that each of them is an integral and essential part of your daily life in Christ. So let's return to the first epistle of Peter. I try saying epistle of Peter, it gets that difficult. Chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8, as they need to be taken together. We've managed to do one verse so far. But verses 6 to 8 need to be taken together. Take note of the contrast between those who believe and those who do not. Beginning in verse 6. For thus it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, honored, precious, chief cornerstone. And he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, shall never be disappointed or put to shame. To you then who believe, who adhere to, trust in, and rely on him, is the preciousness. But for those who disbelieve, it is true, the very stone which the builders rejected has become the main cornerstone, and a stone that will cause stumbling, and a rock that will give men offense. They stumble because they disobey and disbelieve God's word, as those who reject him were destined and appointed to do. There are several scriptural references for these verses which Peter combines to illustrate that Jesus, the Messiah, is not only the chief cornerstone of the Christian church, but that he was rejected by the very people who needed him most. I think they also make a poignant commentary on the world today where the exact same thing is still happening. People are still rejecting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who is the only answer to the issues facing this world. Let's look. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. This one from the Amplified. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. He who believes, trusts in, relies on, and adheres to that stone will not be ashamed or give way or hasten away in sudden panic. See where Peter's taking it from. Some of these I used last time. Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Back to the New King James. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Matthew 21 and verse 42. 
Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Acts 4 and verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Isaiah 8 and verse 14. Isaiah 8, 14. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see where Peter's drawing from, the Old Testament. And Romans 9, 33. Romans 9, 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There's plenty of clear references here. And as I was researching this, I came across what can only be called a fascinating historical fact. Let me quote it from R. Tuck's The Pulpit Commentary. I found this really interesting. It should be pointed, I'm quoting here, it should be pointed out that this famous line is founded upon an actual event. In the building of Solomon's temple, the first stone that came down from the quarry was very remarkably shaped having been marked and cut at the quarry. The builders of the temple did not know what to do with it, and it was dragged to a place apart and became finally hidden by debris and rubbish. It was afterward found to be that on which the completeness of the structure depended, the chief cornerstone where the two walls met and were bonded together. I just found that fascinating. I find verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 2 is quite relevant for the world today. <clears throat> Since Jesus is clearly still a stumbling block and an offense for a great many people. Yes, this can obviously apply to a large number of Jews, Though from what I understand, more and more are actually turning to the Lord almost on a daily basis. But the rest of the world seems to want any other possibility or solution to the problems of the world except turning to Jesus. As the verse declares, they disbelieve God's word, they disobey God's word, and they reject the cornerstone the creator of not only the Christian church, but also the entire world. Now, as things fall out, yesterday, Margaret Marg sent me an email with a poem in it, written by a 15-year-old schoolgirl in America. And I was so impressed with it that because it fits what I'm saying, that I printed it out, and you can ask Margaret more, more details about how she got it afterwards. But it's a 15-year-old schoolgirl who got an A-plus for this uh, as a new school prayer from someone from Minnesota. Wrote this, <clears throat> and I really liked it. Now I sit me down in school Remember, the, you can't pray in American schools or read the Bible anymore, right? Now I sit me down in school where praying is against the rule. For this great nation under God finds mention of him very odd. In Scripture now, the class recites, it violates the Bill of Rights. 
And any time my head I bow becomes a federal matter now. Our hair can be purple, orange, or green. That's no offense. It's a freedom scene. The law is specific. The law is precise. Prayers spoken aloud are a serious vice. For praying in a public hall might offend someone with no faith at all. In silence alone, we must meditate. God's name is prohibited by the state. We are allowed to cuss and dress like freaks and pierce our noses, tongues, and cheeks. They've outlawed guns, but first the Bible. To quote the good book makes me liable. We can, select, we can elect a pregnant senior queen and the unwed daddy our senior king. It's inappropriate to teach right from wrong. We're taught that such judgments do not belong. We can get our condoms and birth controls, study witchcraft, vampires, and totem poles. But the Ten Commandments are not allowed. No word of God must reach this crowd. It's scary here, I must confess, when chaos reigns, the school's a mess. So, Lord, this silent plea I make, should I be shot, my soul please take. Amen. I like that. I thought I'd share it. Thank you, Margaret. <coughs> One other image which I really like that can be found in these verses is the idea that as a cornerstone, creating a corner, at a corner, see two things coming together in a corner. Is that the picture? As a cornerstone, Christ unites and joins together both the Jews and the Gentiles. This too was and still is a stumbling block for many on both sides. But that's what he does. He unites the Jews and the Gentiles. They come together in him. This theme of unity is then extended and given more specific detail in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The titles used here are all ones that were traditionally applied to the Jews, to the nation of Israel, but now they're being applied to the believers in Christ, the Christians as well. Let's briefly examine their origins. First of all, Deuteronomy, chapter 7 and verse 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 7 and verse 6 in the New King James, says this. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of of the earth. And then Exodus 19 and verse 6. Exodus 19 verse 6 says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. This is what the Jews were supposed to be. But unfortunately, they failed to meet God's standard. However, Peter now applies this same standard to us. And the question remains, are we meeting it ourselves? Can we meet this standard? The simple answer is no. We are not in general meeting our obligations, nor can we, without the ongoing help of the Holy Spirit. 
That in part was why Jesus had to come himself to fulfill those obligations. We are incapable of doing so in our own strength, by our own ability. The worrying concern is that the so-called wider Christian community, the so-called wider Christian community doesn't really seem to care much about doing this. And yet this is a mandate from God. You know, quite like the ancient nation of Israel. They just don't seem to worry about that. They've got a lovely social gospel. But are they doing what God wants his people to do? And are they relying on the Holy Spirit to do it? Because that's the only way. The second half of verse 9 sets out precisely what we are called to do. Isn't that good of God? To set it out precisely for us? Right? That you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Sounds easy, doesn't it? We simply have to witness for the Lord in everything we say and in everything we do. We have to display all of his virtues and all of his perfections as we go about our daily lives. No problem, right? How are you doing? This is obviously an incredible challenge. But don't be discouraged. Not only did God send us a helper, the Holy Spirit, but he realizes that accomplishing this will take us a lifetime, if not longer. This is what we refer to as the process of sanctification, something we have all dealt with several times from this pulpit. It is not and never will be instantaneous. It is something we have to work at every single day, guided, strengthened, and enabled by the Holy Spirit. The moment you attempt to do this in your own strength, you will fail. But fortunately, when this happens, and it does to all of us, right? None of us are perfect. We're all human. We all fail. But when that happens, God is quick to forgive those who truly repent. That's the good news. And finally, we come to verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. Peter here is referencing the Old Testament prophet Hosea, who foretold of the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's plan for mankind. Turn please to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10. In the New King James, verse 9, Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. And then turn over the page to Hosea chapter 2 and verse 23. Hosea chapter 2 and verse 23. Then I will sow for her, sorry, then I will sow her for myself in the earth. And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, 
and they shall say, you are my God. We also find these verses from Hosea referenced in the book of Romans, where it clearly indicates that they are to be applied to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Romans chapter 9, verses 22 to 26. Romans 9, beginning at verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. What we see here is a demonstration of God's overwhelming love. We were once not his people, but now we are. We were once not recipients of his great mercy, but now we are. And none of this was because of our own worth or merit but solely on the basis of the completed work of Christ and our acceptance, faith, trust, and reliance on that completed work. He did everything, and we are able to reap the benefits of that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and none other. Could I ask the musicians to begin coming back, please? There are many challenges in this passage from Peter, but there is great encouragement also. We are not alone as we walk the path he has set before us. It all begins with acknowledging that we are sinners who need to repent and turn from our old ways to follow the Son. It continues by committing our lives to our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Only then can we begin the process of sanctification, where we walk in harmony with the Lord of glory. If you haven't already done this, then please make sure you don't walk out of here today without speaking to one of us about your eternal destiny. It may be the last chance you'll ever have.